Hello and welcome back to the Linux Panic YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be resuming the Linux from scratch series with part eight. But first, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future videos and give the notification bell a good old ring whilst you're at it. So here we are, we have finally completed uh, chapter eight. The hell that is that. Now we're ready to move on to chapter nine system configuration. So this is just going through and setting up uh, everything we need to do. So in the introduction, uh, chapter 9.1, because bearing in mind, I'm using version 11.1 system D, not 11.1 errata or 11.2 system D or 11.2 errata. Because 11.2 has since come out since we started this journey. So we're in keeping with 11.1. So here are our setup options. It goes over discussing configuration files, system D services, general configs and new setup, issues that affect proper setup of devices, configuring system clock and keyboard layout. That's a tough one. I've looked into it and tried to do it earlier. It is a tough one if you don't know what you're doing. And brief introduction to scripts and configurations, files when used in user logs. And of course, configuring behavior. So first off, let's start with 9.2. Uh, starting with version 209, system D ships with network config uh, daemon called system D network D. So there's that, the hour device naming. You do, so just uh, going over the process of how it does, what it does. Uh, if we want to do, if we prefer the classical customized network interface names, there are three alternative ways to do that. Uh, mask udevs.link file for the default policy writing in a manual naming scheme or in the grub boot uh, boot grub grub cf uh, config pass the option to dotnet iframes uh, in interface names equals zero but we're not doing that we're going to be setting up a static ip config so first let's just have a quick sip of your drink in my case it's a cup of coffee and we are going to get the dh CP configuration. We're going to copy this. Uh, not read only. We're going to paste this into the terminal. And what that's going to do is just going to set everything up. We do need to uh, go to it. So we need to do uh, vi slash edc slash system d slash network slash 10 tab enter insert network device name is going to be. ENP zero uh, N five, I believe it is. We just confirm by doing IPA. Doing IPA it says ENP zero S three. ENP zero S three. Control C. Colon W right quit and we with the exclamation mark overwrite anything that was previously there. So it's basically just doing it with pseudo. We're setting up the DHCP. We could go with static. In this scenario, I'm just using DHCP because it's going to help later on down the line. Uh, creating the resolve file. The if the system is going to be connected to the internet, then it needs some means of domain name service. So you know, basically just utilizing the internet to its fullest extent. The best this is best achieved by placing the IP address of the DNS server available from the ISPL network administrator into ETC resolve. Now to do that with resolve, with if a static uh, etc resolve is desired, create it by following. But because we didn't go static, we went with DHCP. We don't have to touch this. Sip of coffee. Uh, configuring the host name. So what we need to do here is we just need to copy this, paste this in. I'm just going to give this the host name of LFS. So we just need to get rid of these two arrows here. Hit enter, and then do. Uh, just cat slash etc slash host name and host name. So our host name is set correctly for the Linux from the Linux from scratch. This is calling upon uh, the system, which of course is the live install. But in this case, this is the host name that we want, which is LFS, which is good. Uh, decide a fully qualified domain name and possible aliases for use in etc host file if using static IB addresses. We'll also need to decide on an IP address because I haven't gone with static. I know all I've done is just set the host name and gone with a DHCP. We don't need to touch any of that, which is fine. We can just move on from here. 
That's why it's the benefit of using the benefit of using uh, static. I benefit of using DHCP if you don't want to go through and set everything up. Um, decided for fully qualified domain name and possibilities for using etc hosts. If uh, it's using static IP addresses, you need to decide an IP. Um, that just goes over the IP selection scheme and the pro select processing off, which is fine. So just to be on the safe side, I am going to set a hosts file just to be on the safe side. So what we're going to do is want to do paste this in and make some changes. So first off, because the I I'm going to be using the uh, IP of this machine, which is four. I want to get rid of this one. So the fully qualified domain name I have already selected is if I can find it. Ah, yes, it's uh, this one here. Because the LFS book gives you one, you can just copy paste it. In this case, it's lfs.example.org, the valid IP, the valid uh, fully qualified domain name. So I might as well just use the one in the book. So in this case, it's just going to be uh, lfs example.org followed by a host name of lfs and an alias of lfs and that is problem solved now just to be and we can just remove the square brackets and leave everything else in place we have oh, that was nearly bad so I'm just going to get rid of, I'm just going to put this incorrectly. So it's going to be LFS, lfs.example.org, lfs.example.org. And go all the way to the end. That is our hosts file set up. It's at the end and then just end a file. That is now in. So if we do cat slash etc slash hosts, we now have our setup. Hosts file, which is what we want. Next thing we want to do is move over to here. This is just going over the how devices are handled, how to set up and as such, because there's no nothing here that we need to execute. We can just move on. Uh, you can sit and read it if you'd like to. I've already gone through, so I'm just going to move on. Managing devices, dealing with duplicate devices. So for example, multiple network cards. It's not uncommon these days to have multiple network cards because well, the state of computing has developed significantly in the past 10 years to the point where having more than one network uh, interface is, you know, it's acceptable on, on, on consumer machines, let alone server machines. So have a sip of coffee, have a read through, because I'm not going to have, not, be, not going to be having duplicate devices. I'm just going to leave this alone. We'll move on. Configuring the system clock, this just goes through the process of setting up the clock, which is kind of important. So we need to create uh, the time. So create uh, etc adjust time while with the contents. If your hardware clock gets it to local time, if etc AD, uh, adj time isn't present the first boot, uh, system d time dated will assume that the hardware clock is set to UC and adjust the file accordingly. You can also use the time date CTL to utility to tell the System D time dated if your hardware clock is set to UTC or not. I'll tell you what, we'll just do this because that isn't exactly the clearest of thing. So what we want to do is time date CTL. And do that. System has not been booted with system D as an init system PID one cannot operate, fail to connect to boss. This is expected. So we're just going to copy this, input that. It's just saying, hey, look, it'll be fine. Uh, I'm going to set this. Again, it's going to come back with, hey, look, system's not being booted yet, which we're coming up to that. So this is a ahead of time. Keep an eye on this. I want to do, we just want to grab this. So network time synchronization, we want to enable this. Just make sure it is enabled. Going to respond with the same oh, it didn't respond the same again but this is ready and set up uh, this can be ignored i'll tell you what we'll uh 
set up the date time and we want to be time zone america slash new york for me again it's going to say hey look couldn't do it because guess what it's not being booted yet it's the expected outcome now we move on to configuring the the console so this is just the time and data this is just the uh, map for everything so in this case uh, my uh, key maps are the following so what we need to do is we're going to just copy this in paste it but not hit enter so my font map is going to be It is just going to be US. And again, we're just going to be lowercase US because that's what it is in the font map. And again, with this one, it is just going to be US. Hit enter. That's what it comes back as every time. Uh, we can also use this to set various things, but we're not going to. Uh, you can change key map value. Uh, uh, at runtime by using locale control utility locale control set map map oops let's sort it out um so our locale we do need to set that here so what i'm going to do is copy this and uh, if previously in the book uh we in previous videos i didn't do a didn't do all the locales but because this is a fresh run on linux like the virtual machine is now running on Linux instead of Windows. It delivers or I installed all of the locales as we can see here. All of them. So to set the locale, what I need to do is just copy this, paste this in, and my locale is going to be the following locale. It is going to be equals lang. Equals en underscore us dot iso hyphen eight eight five nine hyphen one. It's the local character map, and we can just go to just hit enter. Look, I cannot set these. No such file or directory. This is fine because it just set them for all. Because I've not gone through and done these, that's fine. We can set these individually all different, all to different ones. But because I'm not going to, that's fine. So once proper, proper locale settings have been determined, I need to create the locale config. So what I need to do is just copy paste this in. And again, need to do the same. So it's just going to be en underscore us dot iso apostrophe 8859-1. Oh, 59069, nice. 8859-1. And then again, enter, enter file. That was expected. Problem solved. Now I can modify that with the locale a control utility to use it. Just for example, and on that, I can also specify other languages if I want to. So it just says, hey, look, this and then this. But this is fine. Now we're going to move on to the input RC file. But first, have a sip of coffee. Mm. Black coffee, no sugar. Mm. The only way to drink coffee and still be healthy. Because uh, uh, black coffee, no sugar, is just majoritively water. So you can drink as much coffee as you want and still be healthy. Anyway, the input RC file is the configuration file for readline library. It provides editing capabilities once the user is entering a, a line from the terminal. It works by translating key uh, inputs from the keyboard into specific actions. So just D into D, it just does all sort of translation in between. That's all this does. Below is the generic global input uh, RC, along with commands to explain what the various options do. Note that commands cannot be on the same line. Comments cannot be on the same line. The commands create the file using the following. So I'm just going to copy the example because I don't want to change it. Copy this, paste it in, hit paste, and done. We've got end of file. I like how it's I've got some for the Linux console, the X term and console, so the KDE conversion. That's very nice. Moving on to shells. The shells files contain a list of login shells on the system. Application is used to determine whether the shell is valid or not. So just logging in, which is fine. So again, we just want to do copy and paste. It's done. System D usage and configuration. Uh, 
the system the assist config file contains a set of options to control basic operations the default file has all entries commented and out with the default settings indicated this file is where the log level may be changed as well as some basic logging settings see comp5 manual pa man page for details for each configuration option the normal behavior for system d is to clear the screen at the end of the boot sequence if desired this behavior may be changed so just sometimes some operating systems just spew out what they're doing on boot this could change that so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to do the boot messages can always be reviewed by using journal control hyphen b as we use so i'm just going to do copy place this in hit enter directory created at getty at tty1.surface.d which is expected uh, by default the temp Folder is created by tempfs. If this is not desired, it can be overwritten by executing the following command. Alternatively, a separate partition for temp. It, it. If a separate partition is desired, specify that in the Fs tab. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, hey, look, don't do that. Thank you. And problem solved. Do not create the symbolic link above for a separate partition. If I need to just go mute Discord right quick. And do not disturb. Hi, Peter, if you're watching this video. Do not create the symbolic link above if separate partition is used for temp. This will prevent the root file system from being remounted. Read write and make system as table when booted. Because it's not separate, it's fine. Um, if, desired, if the default parameters are not desired, then you can copy. I'm just. If, ah, the default parameters are desired, so I'm just going to leave them be. Uh, overriding default services behavior the parameters of a unit can be overridden by creating a directory and config file in etc system d system for example this mobile.conf fucked up beyond all recognition that's pretty good uh, so i'm not going to copy that because it's an example and i don't need to change anything at all it's just going over a couple of things. Working with core dumps. Core dumps are useful to debug crash, crashed programs, especially when a the daemon process when a daemon process crashes. On system D booted systems, uh, the core dumping is handled by core dump. It'll log the core dump in the journal and store the core dump itself in var lib system D core dump to retrieve and process core dumps. The core dump CTL tool is provided here in examples of frequently used commands. Ah, uh, so reverse chronological order i or info shows the information on the last core dump or debug loads the last core dump to gdb and that sends you through to somewhere else that's fine core dumps may take up a lot of disk space the maximum disk space by used by core dumps can be limited by creating config file uh, you see systemd core dump conf.d so for example i am going to use that because the virtual machine is only 50 gig in space so i feel like that's a good idea and this is just saying, hey, look, this is what long running processes will encounter. And we're now done with uh, part eight and chapter nine. So I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Uh, sorry, this is a day late. It's just, it took me quite a while and I lost some progress twice through mistakes of my own, not Windows this time, because I'm using Manjaro rule. Anyway, I would like to thank you very much for. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. If you didn't, uh, the other button works as well. You might not be able to see them, but I can see both of them. Anyway, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed. If you didn't, that's okay. Give the notification bell a ring if you, if you did subscribe. I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I have been Nick. You have been amazing. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.